Hey folks, Steve here with another Nations in Arms video for you today. And this one we'll be looking at the 1815, the 100 days or the 100 days scenario. The 100 days scenario. Uh, which is the sort of last hurrah, the War of the Seventh Coalition, the final grandstand. Uh, decided to do this scenario after the last one, which we covered for the Spires of the Kremlin 1812 scenario, because... The Napoleon at Bay 1813 campaign, which would run for two years, so eight turns, um, to me felt like it was going to be very similar to this one with France basically on the defensive retreat. Um, and it didn't necessarily make sense to me to kind of retread that yet again. And knowing that this isn't too dissimilar in some ways from the War of the First Coalition with France largely on the defensive. Um, so I, I figured I would just go straight from the previous uh, scenarios to this one as sort of the capstone, the final scenario that we'll play here on the channel before we go do the review and move on to other games. So um, this scenario, much like the last one we covered, is just a three-turn scenario. So it is 1815. We will be playing a summer, uh, autumn, and winter turns. Uh, there are no winter campaign cards at play here, which means that uh, the winter quarters chit will be very important, and because France is on the defense uh, for the whole time, basically, France will be wanting winter to come and come early, or they will want the turns to end quickly. But before we do that, we'll have a summer turn here where, you know, every chit will get played, basically. Um, and I do find that these shorter scenarios tend to matter a whole lot, like every action you take matters a whole lot, um, where in the grand campaign you can kind of um, expect to get more turns, you can kind of expect to do more things, and you can kind of deal with setbacks a little bit easier. Here in these very time-boxed scenarios, every die roll can matter a whole lot more. Um, there's no production uh, in this scenario like the previous one. There will be some scheduled reinforcements that will come in during autumn and winter, for each side in various places, so there will be a little bit of a reinforcement aspect to this, um, but but not a whole lot, uh, ultimately. And we can see already um, that France is kind of in a tough situation. Uh, there are uh, Spanish forces, just like I just adjust the camera a little bit. Uh, there are some Spanish forces down here that will be trying to push north and capture uh, Toulouse and Bordeaux, uh, pressure uh, Lyon eventually in time. Uh, we also have uh, Austrian forces, actually a number of them. So there's a smaller uh, army of Italy uh, with a couple other minor forces. Piedmont has been resurrected uh, to push into the southeastern part of France. Um, there are actually Vendee uh, rebels that are uh, here. This is sort of, you know, for to understand the historical context, Napoleon had been deposed. There had been a restoration type of activity in France, but uh, Napoleon escaped his imprisonment and sort of re-raised a new, you know, uh, uh, kind of took control in France yet again. And there are some sort of royalist-minded uh rebels there, so that's something, you know, even on the west side of the map or the west coast of France, we're going to have uh, some enemy actions to deal with. Um, there are other Austrian forces here in Switzerland, which is conquered by the uh, the Austrians, and uh, some other forces, the Austrian army of, uh, uh, of the Rhine, uh, which is a pretty potent force of, if I'm looking right, uh, I think that's 16 steps. Yeah, looking like 16 steps, so pretty scary, um, but, but a little bit further behind everybody else. There are a string of Prussian forces here uh, along the border of Germany and into the Low Countries. Uh, Blücher is here with a decent-sized force of eight steps, uh, but there are several core nearby, so the, the Prussian force is actually spread out a bit creating a wall of coalition forces that hope to come into France itself. We have Wellington with the Anglo-Dutch army, uh, and it, it is also uh, quite sizable. Um, if I'm looking at, I think it's 12 steps currently, uh, with a small contingent right here. And to defend France, there's not even that 
many forces uh, in the South. There are just a couple core that that are going to have to hope for the best. Uh, there is a small force here. There's an army of Italy that is actually only four steps, so uh, roughly equivalent in strength to this Austrian army, but generally the Austrians have more forces here. Uh, there are some scattered French corps uh, here that, that are potent enough to be a threat. Uh, there's a French army of Germany that uh, is just just three steps, so not even that much. Um, and then we have uh, a minor corps here at Orléans, Davou holding a home defense force in Paris itself, a minor, and then Napoleon, who is not at the head of the Grand Armée, it is actually the Army of the North, uh, but he does have uh, a pretty, pretty potent stack there of uh, 15 steps, and um, they're there, there are some of the guard, which are going to be important. Uh, the French have already called out conscripts uh, in the scenario rules, which means that any of the French corps with a plus two actually just have a plus one. So in, in this scenario, I mean, it, it really just comes down to can the coalition conquer France? That's the victory condition, is to conquer France. They also uh, need to take, I think it's Orléans and... Uh, and Metz. So where's Metz? Right here. So they need Metz and Orléans as well, which which really requires, just generally speaking, that most of France or you know most of these areas here uh, end up being captured by the coalition. So that means the Spanish have to do reasonably well and capture Bordeaux along with all these other areas. If the coalition can get into France, or I'm sorry, into Paris, not France, they can get into Paris. They may be able to ignore some of the other key cities if the French armies are destroyed and or demoralized. So um, you can imagine, you know, obviously this scenario ended historically in French defeat. Um, whether or not it goes this way, well, we'll have to see. The coalition has the War Council card, which could come in handy in a, in a sort of like get back into good shape, you know, a little extra oomph to rally demoralized forces. Well, uh, Napoleon has fear of the sound of guns and a flank march. So basically he can, he can very likely stop someone from getting away and then keep their buddies from helping them. And he could play both of these cards. And I do think, I wonder if I should have Napoleon attack Wellington, uh, flank march him so that he can't get away, fear of the sound of guns so that Blucher and the other corps can't help Wellington, and try to very quickly annihilate that uh, British stack, and then that would give him the opportunity uh, to def to defeat in detail some of these other forces, such that um, if the Prussians can be scattered, uh, then the French can shift gears uh, further south to deal with the Austrians, um, and hope that the rest of the southern theater hasn't collapsed uh, enough to to be in a conquer condition. I think that's the general grand strategy for for the French. Um, use Napoleon as best you can, defeat the armies in detail, um, and and basically solve the northern theater and just delay in the southern theater. For the coalition, um, I, I don't think there's a huge strategy here other than to progress and where possible um, cut French armies out of supply so that they can be eliminated, which can open the door for smaller corps that are not in armies to actually swarm through holes in the line and capture uh, fortresses and or Paris itself. So um, basically the coalition wants to use its greater numbers and, and forces out separated into separate corps to try to, to just get around the French armies as best that they can. Um, the French will have to be similarly maybe cutting some of these coalition armies out of supply and then attacking them, uh, being benefited from internal lines of communication. That is a powerful tool when a force is attacking a national territory, as we've seen in, in the other videos and the playthroughs of this game. Um, it's, it is hard to, to enter into national territory without overwhelming force where you can have multiple lines of supply or uh, be able to create more supply paths. It's always very tough because the defending army can often make maneuvers that you can't because they can draw supply from different locations.
cut you out of supply and, and basically have a very definitive battle advantage. So we'll see. It will be an interesting little exercise. I also think this is a pretty neat little scenario just to play if you're trying to learn the game um, because you're, you're really just using the West map. So there's only, you know, you could reasonably get out one map and just play this scenario, set it up and, and have an exciting little thing. Um, look for your Battle of Waterloo, right? <laughs> Which we'll see in some capacity. Uh, the French do have the first chit with initiative, and I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and let them have it as the uh, number four chit. That way uh, we get the first activation right out of the way, and we know we won't have any back-to-back -back activations where we won't be able to do much, and this enables... Uh, this enables Napoleon to act. We could move Davu up if we wanted to. I'm not sure I'm going to do that. Um, and I guess we can move Suche down here with the Army of uh, Italy. But I don't think there's much for him to do. He's more playing linebacker right now. So uh, we'll, we'll start things off with the bang with Napoleon and see how much damage he can quickly do. And then um, kind of go from there, I guess. So uh, yeah, first things first, we'll, we'll play the four chip. And what, what we may do, because this will be a shorter video, I may show some of the big action uh, on camera as we go, but um, I'm going to think through this first activation and just see uh, what makes the most sense to, to go for. Maybe Napoleon goes for Blucher instead of Wellington, but I think we hit Wellington while he's weak, uh, where he can't get help with the two card plays, have a reversal of Waterloo maybe, and if we're, if we're really fortunate... Um, annihilate his stack, and then that'll shift the overall uh, odds uh, for the French much more in their favor. Okay, we're getting ready to do our, I guess, our version of Waterloo. We'll see. Napoleon went here to here and is then moving into the hex with Wellington. Um, what I've done is I've done all the interception attempts and all that good stuff, and I've worked out the die roll modifiers for the combat. wanted to talk quickly through that. So Wellington uh, did try to intercept because um, it, uh, based on the modifiers that were coming up, that they would have been a little better off trying to intercept Napoleon and get the bonus. Uh, they failed to do that. Um, and then we also had uh, Blucher's failure to intercept into Wellington's hex though a secondary Prussian force here did successfully intercept. Uh, so that added two full-strength corps, one cavalry, one infantry, to Wellington stack. That did make a difference for some of the modifiers. Um, and so uh, then we also played uh, Fear uh, of the Sound of Guns so that Wellington can get no more help. Technically, we've not played the Flank March card, so... Uh, and we we ended up not having to uh, because we decided to try to stand and fight uh, with Wellington here. And so we, we didn't end up needing to play this. So the French still have it. And then because this is a major battle, this is actually one of the biggest battles I've fought in the system. Where it's like, I don't have to, I don't have to recount, but... Um, it's like 15 to 16 steps or something like that. It's a pretty, pretty big battle. Uh, over 30 steps, we have the tactics cards. And I'd say the French player kind of got out cleaner on this one. Um, when it comes to the tactics cards, because I'm playing both hands, I had to make a decision on who gets to look at their cards first. So what I tend to do is I, I get the tactics cards, I deal out the cards to each side, and I don't flip the cards over to look at them until one side is picked. Uh, what cards to play, and I tend to give uh, the general with the better uh, combat rating or initiative rating uh, the option to go second, because if I see a card that cancels another card, I can't erase that from my brain when I'm looking between cards, but generally the better general should have the better ability to respond there. So as it happens, Wellington played successfully played two cards. He played Redoubt, which gave him another plus one, and he also got Panic, which was the better of the other cards that he drew, um, which would increase the potential for the French army to panic and do more damage if the British win the combat. Uh, conversely, France uh, 
got both a grand charge and a flank attack successfully being used. The uh, British, uh, ironically enough, had the card to block grand charge, but um, I had played their cards first uh, before I looked at the French, and so lost opportunity there, uh, which gives a total of a plus five to the French die roll, which makes the uh, die roll modifiers pretty extreme. Uh, the French have a plus uh, 14 of the die roll after everything is added together, um, which is which is pretty strong. Uh, the British have a plus uh, eight. So a, a pretty significant advantage. What I suspect is gonna happen is both sides are gonna max out on the combat table and some of these modifiers won't matter, and then it's going to end up being a tied battle, uh, and there may be a second round. Um, so that's kind of the the thing I would, I'm going to end up having to watch out for, I guess. So first things first, we'll just roll for the uh, the the French. So a plus fourteen of the die roll. Uh, they rolled a nine plus fourteen is way off the chart, so they will definitely have will have scored. Uh, a maximum result of seven step losses with a CL. Um, and that will roll for the British with their plus eight. And uh, we got a nine plus eight is 17. So both sides are going to lose seven step losses. Uh, so I need to think through this for a second. Um, one... Three, four, five, six, seven. That's gnarly. Um, and then uh, let's see for the British, they lose one. Two, three, five, six, seven. Yeesh. Um, and then it's a choice to go a second round. Um, now, when we do the second round, uh, we would ordinarily get more March to the Sound of Guns, but this is a second round. It's not a distinct battle, so I do not believe Wellington can count on any additional support. So this leaves it to be... Uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight steps. Wow, bloody. Um, eight steps to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, to nine steps. I do have to do some leader checks, so let me take care of that and get ready for the next roll. Okay, so what will might end up being a Pyrrhic victory, even when we get to the end of this, um, we have, uh, for Napoleon, after all the things are, are calculated, uh, and the cards will have a plus 11 on the minor battle uh, results table. The coalition will have a plus 6. So again, a, a major modifier advantage to the French, but it almost won't matter because they'll probably both cap out. And if they both cap out, it does make me wonder if the Prussians aren't going to be able to swing through and win the day eventually here. Um, with the cards, the uh, British were only able to play the slope card to give them an extra plus one. The French got panic, so this could increase the possibility that the British panic, and a flank attack, which helped contribute to that massive advantage in die roll modifier. So we'll do the roll. Plus 11. Uh, so we got an 8 plus 11 is 19, which is, yeah, max maximum result. For the French against the British, the British rolling with a plus six. Uh, wow, and they got a nine, and a six is a 15. So the, the French do win. Um, so they need to take three step losses. So one, two, three. That's rough, man. That army's really busted for the French. And then, gosh, a whole five for the British. So one, two, 
two, three, four, uh, five. Yikes. Um, yikes, yikes, yikes. Uh, that's really rough, all things considered. Um, and then the morale of the British was four going in. Uh, that drops to two. Goes back up by two to four, so we're going to roll. Uh, the panic is going to add a die roll, so if the British become demoralized here, we could see them... Um, we could actually see them be eliminated outright, uh, which could, could very well be uh, the case here. So, let me think about this for a second. Um, yeah, so the morale was four, down to two, up two, so four, five, or six due to the card, they'll demoralize. Four, five, or six, we got a four. So uh, the British army is, the British Prussian army, is demoralized. Um, so they're going to take one two, one, two, three steps in losses. And so that will be, uh, let's see. One, two, three, and then the rest are demoralized. So with a single with a single step, uh, Wellington retreats, and uh, whoops, I need a demoralization marker. Demoralized with a single step, Napoleon uh, not looking so good after that victory. To be quite honest. Um, Yeesh. Uh, so he went one, two, three, four, five, six. And he'll probably be absorbing this guy into the stack. And it's a first activation marker. So. Um, I don't know what you want to look at that in terms of was that a real victory? Uh, because yes, the the French army under Napoleon has has defeated Wellington and has also uh, really destroyed a couple Prussian corps. That's very important. You could look at that as a you know did 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 Napoleon just win Waterloo? Well, he did so at a very uh, very pricey. Um, cost. I mean, he's lost nine steps altogether. Uh, we still have to do leader checks, but I'll do that in a second. But but again, um, just really rough. Uh, nine steps. You know, we eliminated um, a lot more British steps, but we're going to need those French steps to fend off the Prussians because the Prussians are still are still uh, fresh here. This side core. Okay, that's a single step of infantry, a single step of, of cavalry. Basically, the British have two steps on the board. That's not much. And maybe we could look at that and say that they have ne negligible ability to respond to us. But the Prussians still have one, two, three steps there. One, two, three, four steps, seven steps. And then the Army of the Elba, which has two, four, six, eight. So there's still 15 steps of Prussians right here. And then there's even a couple Hessians here and all the Austrians. So um, the number of French on the board is, is not nearly enough to... Uh, it, it, it doesn't feel like we walked while we won. I don't think as the French were feeling particularly good. Um, but those die roll modifiers, I mean, it was just going to be a bloodbath anyway. Um, we can be glad that we won. But, but it's going to be uh, still tough to see, you know, what happens from here on out. Anyway, that was the first chit. It felt important to play through that and to do the die rolls uh, on camera because, again, uh, that was sort of Waterloo. I guess that would be as near as Waterloo as we could get. Blucher did not show up. Some of the Prussians did. Ultimately, France won out. 
and now we'll end up going to the chit cup and we'll we'll play through okay the next chit that was drawn was the coalition one which meant everything on the board on the coalition side could move uh the austrians are starting to push into provence and in fact one sneaky cavalry put itself out of supply to sit on top of leon that is uh Gonna kind of require them. I need to look one, or even one. Oh, dang it! It's not really gonna help the supply, but they can still act as a raider here for Suche. Um, so maybe that's my mistake. In Spain, the French forces moved through here, eliminated this fortress at Perpignan. And the Spanish did take and have restored uh, Bayonne with the French defense outside Bordeaux. So the southern front starting to catch in. The Vendée rebels have taken Nantes. Um, I don't know what there is to do with these guys. I don't know if they're allowed to leave the Vendée. Uh, Vendée. Um, it says it can't leave their national territory. And like this is the Vendée rebels, which seems to imply that, you know, they can't leave the Vendee, so at best I'm just going to worry about taking fortresses that could potentially be uh, supply paths for other coalition armies or a nice landing spot uh, for Wellington to uh, to do a, a move to here, maybe pick up those guys and uh, kind of do an outflank. Uh, as it stands, Napoleon is still there in Lille, but the Prussians have actually pushed through. They took Rez. Uh, the other corps have kind of protect, looking to protect supply lines a little bit. And then Blucher, uh, not Blucher, uh, Thielman, Thielman has marched into Paris and has actually forced that French force to retreat, uh, which is significant. And then uh, I should also point out that the Austrian army of the Rhine marched into Strasbourg and actually succeeded in overrunning the French Army of Germany, which only had three steps in it. The Austrian Army of the Rhine has 16. So they, they failed their avoidance check, and the Austrians apparently just stomped them out of existence and are now sitting on top of Strasbourg looking to uh, take that fortress here soon and then continue to push through. So already uh, the French are not doing reasonably well uh, at this point, and they're in a bit of trouble there. Um so we'll have to see what can be done. The French will go next and land three. So most everyone's going to be able to activate. Um, I certainly think that uh, Napoleon's going to try to swing down and relieve Paris and then figure out what he can do to defend against the Prussians and the Austrians who are coming in to spell his doom. So let me take care of that uh, off camera. Okay, here we are at the end of the summer turn. I uh, went through and played through the rest. You can kind of see the situation is not looking good for France. Um, they, they basically have Napoleon's army in the field, uh, their army of Italy, which has come up to the north, just, just trying to clear out coalition forces where they can get them. Um, but, but really, like the remaining French stacks are one's besieged in Bordeaux, Lyon is almost guaranteed to fall here soon to the Austrian army of Italy. The army of the Rhine is slowly penetrating through Metz. The Prussians uh, did uh, try to attack France, but Napoleon intercepted and sent uh, our good buddy um, Blucher uh, set to retreat. And he didn't demoralize, uh, or else we might have seen the Prussian army disappear, but um, in, in terms of a battle of attrition, I mean, you can count on Napoleon likely being able to defeat somebody in the field, but, but soon it won't matter. The French are just going to run out of steps. Um, and the Austrian army of the Rhine is still pretty big and can afford to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, uh, with Napoleon if, if they have to. Um, so overall, uh, I'd say this is going to look like a coalition victory, as would maybe be expected. But there will be some minor reinforcements for autumn. And then, I mean, who knows if, if we can keep the coalition out of Paris, 
uh, we could very well still get some sort of victory there um, because you, you do need Paris to reach any conquer condition. Um, but I think the concentration of forces here is just going to make it that the French armies are trapped. So I'm going to take care of the reinforcements. I'll play through some of the autumn chits and we'll see where things end up. Okay, here we are at the end of autumn, um, and in just uh, somehow <laughs> pulling back the French army of Italy has been pretty valuable. Um, the Austrians made a play for Austria, uh, for Paris rather. The Austrians made a play for Paris. They they almost had it, um, but the French managed to uh, march to the sound of guns and rebuff the Austrians out. The Austrians took incredibly heavy losses in a major battle with Suche, uh, with tactics cards giving the French a, a, a slight edge. The Austrians rolled very poorly, only inflicting only, only inflicting three steps to the French, who had been replenished with the reinforcements from the beginning of the turn. The French rolled uh, a 5 and a 6 for an 11, plus a 5 for a 16, which decimated, or not even decimated, because that's not the right word, is it? Uh, doing six step losses to the Austrians, sending them reeling. Very luckily, they did not demoralize, um, but they are nearly out of gas, though they do have some reinforcements nearby. Um, the, the Prussians are, are a little out of gas. They've got some replenishments coming forward. The British are forming up with the Russians for an army group. So there are still potent coalition forces uh, at play here, but they have to get into Paris, and right now, between the two French armies, they are fighting to the bitter end, it seems. Uh, we did land some British forces over here in the controlled fortress in the Vendée, which gives the coalition yet another angle of attack. But, you know, you can only do so much, right? You can go into to combat, you have to hope you have enough modifiers. If you go in too weak, those forces that attacked are just going to get sliced and diced. So the attrition is something we're watching for, but we do have to build up a coalition force that can actually do the job, and uh, that is turning out to be a bit harder than we might have thought. Now, the, the, the last turn to go is winter, and basically what could happen is we could play a chit, and then the winter quarters comes out, and it's game over. And no matter how you want to look at it politically, in game terms, that could be a French victory. There will also be additional reinforcements coming in. Um, we'll have to look at where they show up. Um, so the, the final winter turn is going to kind of make for a, a, a dead heat here, not to be too punny, um, of how long is that winter turn going to be. It could end at any moment um, after the first shit is played, and the coalition have to do everything they can to try to get into Paris at that point um, to cause the, the victory condition. Um, in terms of actually controlling the needed places, uh, the coalition do control Lyon, Bordeaux, Metz. Uh, they don't control Orléans, which they reasonably can make it there uh, if they just try a little bit harder. Um, so we'll probably see that take place this next turn. Maybe. We'll see. Um, and, and, and if nothing else, we need to try to demoralize the armies. Now, I guess... Um, Given that the German army was destroyed, I guess technically we could ignore Orlean, Orlean but I, I, that, that's up to rules interpretation. Uh, but either way, we do have to get into Paris. So that's kind of the key thing we need to do. Um, so I'm going to go do replenishments, and then I'll, I'll play a chit, and we'll see where we end up at. Okay, so we got two chits before Winter Quarters came out. Um, so it is, I guess, technically a French victory, because the French still control Orléans and Paris. Um, again, I, you know, do they, do they do any kind of peace deal? There's still massive Russian armies coming west, uh, and reinforcements and everything else. So, you know, does, what kind of peace deal happens? It's a victory for the French in game terms, but, um, I'm not sure what you would, what you would call this, you know, maybe... Napoleon ends up having to surrender, and then and he goes back to the island that he had his first exile at, um, or something, or I don't know. I, it's hard to, even this situation, like, do you say that the French remain in power? They've lost control of most of the country, um, 
And uh, so the coalition never got into Paris or ne were never able to keep control of Paris, which means that France is not conquered, which means that France wins this scenario. Um, the one move, uh, the, so the first hit that came out was Empire Land 3. So we were able to use our forces to push the Austrian army that was over here. We came out around and pushed them this way. He's out of supply, heavily reduced. The French armies are feeling okay, and that was as much as we could get out of it. And then I drew the Coalition Land 4 chit, and I couldn't move a whole lot. The The thing with this Russo-British army is that because there's more Russian troops in the army group, the leader is Meningsen. I could have activated Wellington separately and gone to pick up Blucher, um, but... Well, I guess maybe Blucher would have been the commander then because there's more Prussian steps than, than British. But even if we did, we took Wellington and his two steps, moved one, two, three to pick up Blucher, four, five, six. They'd have enough movement to attack Napoleon, but that'd be nine steps against 12 French steps, and Napoleon probably would have won that fight. And either way, the coalition army would not have been able to get into Paris. Um, and I really don't see any other option that would have allowed uh, the capture of Paris basically in in the activations that were there so um, winter ended early I, again I don't know what you what you think of this um, probably some negotiated peace comes out of this right um, still entirely possible that France keeps fighting on and maybe clears these guys out gets some production beats them back at this point, Europe is is so exhausted, right? What do, what do you do? You know, if, if France remains, you know, while occupied, unconquered, and Napoleon is still master of the field, beating a British army, the Prussian army, and the Austrian armies, um, you know, all that's left is to beat the Russians one more time there. Like, I don't know. You know, that that's maybe enough for some decent negotiated peace where, where Napoleon doesn't live in exile. Who knows, right? Who knows? But this uh, scenario was interesting. It made for a, a tense exercise in trying to use interior lines of control and communication to uh, beat back an onslaught of forces. And I did find uh, it was an interesting puzzle. Um, it, at times, it feels really tough for the French, but they get actually quite a number of reinforcements, which makes it still tense throughout. So it was like, oh, at the end of summer, it felt like the French were on their last legs it was going to be game over, but they get just enough reinforcements that the French can still punch back and they still have some decent leaders um, that you can make headway. And they even get an army reinforcement uh, in the last winter term. So at, at the very least, you get the army of Spain and six corps uh, that you can plug in and, and they can still be a potent uh, force, which, which we did use uh, actually to help defeat the Austrians. So um, it, it is not just easy street after summer for the coalition. There is still better fighting, uh, which makes the scenario really tense, and it might make a really good one if you're only going to be able to play this game for a day or a, or maybe you know a few hours uh, with a friend uh, to set this up and play this, because obviously, hey, everyone likes Waterloo for, for war games. Uh, it's very popular. This kind of includes the bit of Waterloo and everything else. There's enough play here that you can get a feel for the the combat system and tactics of the operations you're conducting and still have uh, a, a pretty good time so i do i do like this scenario for that reason it remains tense throughout um and you feel frantically you know bouncing between things like a pinball with your armies trying to keep keep the uh the coalition back and it's not as long as the war of the first coalition it's not bringing in all the production rules of the other campaigns. So this, uh, and it doesn't have the weirdness of the Kremlin scenario. So gosh, I mean, if you're going to, there, there are plenty of scenarios in the game that are worth playing as a single sitting one, but I think this one really does shine. If you're only going to be able to sit down and play this for a little bit, it's a worthwhile exercise and, and a fun to, to play out. So anyway, guys, that's it. Uh, we are done playing Nations in Arms. This was the last Nations in Arms playthrough video. Um, I will still do a uh, review video here in the days and weeks to come. It might have to wait a week uh, because I've got some personal stuff going on i got to take care of. But very soon we'll get the review out. Um, I'll, I'll spoil that a little bit and say this, is, this game's got 
some underbaked parts that could be a concern. Um, there's a couple of rough spots that I, I don't like as much as if it were just a little bit more polished, but there's a lot to love about this game. Um, I really enjoy it. Glad I have it. And uh, we'll cover that in more in the review to come. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video series as we start to wrap up. Uh, plenty more games to play, but uh, truly thank you for watching. Uh, take care. Keep on gaming.